Well, good morning. How are you today? Good. Very good. Hey, I know that uh, this next weekend is July 4th. Um, maybe lots of you will be heading out of town or heading to the lake or heading wherever you're going to be going. And so uh, we will pray for you and all of your travels and uh, pray that you will be safe. Uh, the rest of us will be here. We'll be enjoying Pop Sunday, as uh, Lee was talking about, having that one service. Um, again, just don't forget chairs, blankets, uh, bring those with you to sit on uh, in here. It's going to be a little bit of craziness, but lots of fun. It'll be a brief service. So uh, with your kids in here, we totally understand that. Um, Scott has assured me that we're going to be cleaning the carpet after that Sunday. So when you bring your pop in here and you drip it all over the carpet, we're good to go, just so you know that. Um, but uh, we're looking forward to it. It's going to be um, a great time together. Uh, before I jump into this message, I want to give you an update on things that are happening with our Lee Scott site. Uh, I mentioned several months ago that um, at, uh, our site is, by the way, three and a half years old, and so they passed that three-year mark at uh, the end of this last year. But at the three-year mark, there needs to be a, a really solid plan for the future of any multi-site situation. And, and uh, so we knew that, and so our executive team put together a subcommittee to, uh, of people from Hamilton Road and folks from Lee Scott to work on sort of the path forward. You know, what is that plan going to look like? And so they have been working on that for several months, and um, several things came out of that subcommittee, but a couple that I want to mention this morning. Uh, one of them is that they uh, were looking to get out of Lee Scott. It's not good to exist in a rented facility for a really long time. You kind of need to have some sort of an idea of where you're going into a permanent uh, situation. So um, they had a team that went out and, and looked at all the possibilities of any other place that that site could go to worship on Sunday mornings. And uh, what they discovered is that Lee Scott Academy is really a great place to be. <laughs> there, there really is very little uh, space out there that is affordable enough to be able to uh, uh, make a, a, a Sunday morning situation out of it. So they went back to the folks at Lee Scott Academy, to the administration, and and uh, we're just able to kind of work something out. They have been marvelous. I mean, they have really worked uh, with our leaders, at least God, and said, look, we'll, we'll work it out. We'll um, find a way to make this happen for as long as you need, and uh, even through their big construction projects. So, so that was really important and great that they were able to go ahead and stay there, and that is a good functional facility. But they do have a team that is working on that more permanent situation for them, and and uh, so hopefully they'll have another option at some point. Now, the second thing that came out is kind of a big deal. Um, the subcommittee determined that in looking at all that's happening at Lee Scott is that they are a very healthy and uh, viable uh, site. I mean, they are doing a phenomenal job. Josh is a great leader. He is a great preacher. Um, they uh, have a strong core of leadership. They have a strong core of volunteers, people who are very invested over there. Their finances are in great shape. They're self-sustaining there financially. Um, they have a strong independent spirit at that site. And so in kind of looking at all that, making one big evaluation of what's happening there, they came to this conclusion that the, the next best logical step for Lee Scott is for them to become their own church, to become a church plant of Cornerstone. And uh, so they uh, kind of came to this conclusion, looked at that and said, you know what, we really feel like God is leading us to that place. So they're in a process right now of transition over the next six months, and come January, they're going to launch out uh, on their own and as a church plant of Cornerstone. And we're really excited about this. This is going to give them uh, operationally, this is going to be better for them just to work more efficiently and, and more effectively there. And, and you know, I'm thinking like um, anything that we can do to multiply this movement, we should do that. And uh, there's this verse in Proverbs that, that says, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. And you know, for 16 years, all we've done is follow the Lord's purpose for his next step for us. And we really felt like, you know, we, we sort of prayed at the beginning, Josh and I praying together about this idea and uh, started saying, you know, look, if it's going to happen, the doors will open. If it's not going to happen, you know, it's that classic doors opening, doors closing scenario. And if the doors just keep closing, we're not going to do this. But as we prayed and moved down this road, the doors just kept opening. And we really feel like that verse was coming to play that you know what, this is part of what God wants to do. He's helping us take this next step. So um, we're excited about this. It's going to be great to watch this happen. And one of the things that I love is that on the other side of them becoming their own church is us still doing things together, partnered uh, to do worship nights together, maybe baptism celebrations, go to Uganda together. Josh and I were friends before we were ever colleagues in ministry. That will never change. And so we're going to continue to get together and vision and plan and pray together for things. So 
Um, just kind of looking forward to that moment, these churches sort of working together to make something happen. Josh and I produced a video. Um, it's on the website. If you want to go there, there's just more details, a little bit more discussion about the transition, so you can go there and, uh, and watch that. Okay, um, we're wrapping up this message series called Love God, Love People that we've been in for a few weeks. And um, I hope you've enjoyed being on that end of this series as much as I've enjoyed preaching it and, and Pat and all of us. It's been a good opportunity to make just this important idea so real in our lives of something as uh, profound as love God, love people. So uh, we're going to wrap that up today. Um, two things, we've made some resources available to you. We have this magnet here that has that blessed strategy on here that Pat talked about a couple of weeks ago. It's just a way to engage your neighbor, uh, to engage uh, somebody in your community, for your small group to reach out to somebody. Um, this is a magnet. They're on that round table. It's on the picture up there, but there's a round table out here in the corner of the Resource Center. These are free to you. Pick up as many as you want. Stick them on your refrigerator. It's a great way just to, to be a reminder to you of uh, connecting with people around you. It's also a way for you to pray and just say, God, help me. Help me with whoever that is that needs to be blessed, you know, that, that I need to connect with. And so pick those up. We'd love for you to have those. Also in your chair is this little guy, a little business card. Uh, the first week that I preached, um, we showed a graphic up there, this really colorful graphic that uh, just talks about how we love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And after that Sunday, several of you said, hey, is that going to be made available anywhere? I'd love to have that, you know, and that kind of thing. So we said, all right, we'll make a card. So we produced these little business cards. Um, take these with you. Take as many as you'd like. Uh, you know, tape it on your computer, stick it on the dashboard, put it on the mirror at home, something like that. Again, just as a reminder that, you know, we love God with all that we are and all that we have. And uh, so we just wanted to put those in your hands. Feel free to take those. Again, all of that is available out in the lobby um, for as much as you want. So I'm kind of thinking about this Sunday's message, thinking through this sermon series this past week. I hear this song uh, on the radio that I haven't heard in a long time by this group, and maybe you've heard of them. They're called the Beatles. Have you heard of this group? Yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, how about this song, All You Need Is Love? Do you know this song? And silence fell across the land as old Rusty talked about a song that nobody, anyway. So yeah. So it goes, uh, all you need is love, right? All you need is love, love. All you need is, oh, that's so <laughs> weak. My gosh, are you awake? Are you here? We're not going to sing anymore. I'm not singing anymore. It's not going to do it. I know you're devastated, but I'm just, no. So anyway, so there's this song, All You Need Is Love, right? And there's this, this uh, part in it that says, There's nothing you can make that can't be made. No one can uh, no one you can save that can't be saved. Nothing you can do, but you can learn how to be you in time. It's easy. All you need is love. Love is all you need. Okay, it's a great song, and, and it's really a great sentiment. You know, just this kind of big idea that really, if, if we just allowed love to lead us in this life and in this world, how great would this world be? Okay, so, and, and I get that, and, and that's a powerful statement in itself. But the, the question I have with that, though, is this. What kind of love are we talking about? You know, what kind of love is it that's going to change this world? What kind of love, because I'm not sure that Lennon and McCartney were thinking of the kind of love that I'm talking about today when they wrote this song. And so is it the kind of love that, that I go get a dozen roses and I give it to my honey and I say I love you? Is it the kind of love that says, man, I love a sausage biscuit with egg and cheese on it? I do love that, by the way. I, you know, I love football. I love, you know, frogs. I don't know, whatever. You say, you know, we use that term in so many different directions, so many different ways to talk about this big idea of love. And, but the thing that we have to come back to is um, where does this love come from and what does it mean and, and what do we do with it? And, you know, every time I do a wedding or almost every time, this passage is read either by me or somebody else from 1 Corinthians 13. And we kind of know it as the love passage. And uh, some of you may even know about heart. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not rude. It is not proud. It, you know, anyway, it goes on and on and on. And at the end, it says, love never fails. Love never fails. It's a powerful statement about love. Now, Paul was writing about the love of God, to be clear about that. That it is God's love that never fails, you know. And, and so it is the love that we all depend on and rely on 
because it is the one that doesn't fail. And so when we want to love each other well, like in a marriage or in any other way, you know, we depend on God's love flowing through us to each other. That's the one that works, right? That's the love that we want to be sure is a part of who we are. And so love is obviously this powerful thing, and we remember that it doesn't generate or originate from us. It originates from God. So I want to talk about that a little bit this morning. Um, we're going to go um, all the way over into 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, to kind of look at something that he said about this. 1 John chapter 4, 7 through 12. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. If you don't, we'll have it on the screen for you in just a minute. Um, but John, who was somebody who was close to Jesus, who would have understood this profound love that came to this earth, how it came, why it came, and what it means for all of us, kind of put this down. You know, he wrote this in his, in his letter, in his epistle here, to give us this idea of the nature of love, where it comes from, and what we do with it. So let me read through it, and then we'll talk about it on the other side. He writes this, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is made complete in us. And so John just very clearly lays this out to help us understand where this love comes from, what we do with it, and what it means. And it's interesting that two times he does this dear friends. You know, he's like, I'm not speaking to you as a preacher. I'm not talking to you as a teacher or prophet or something like that. He's like getting right on our love and going, dear friend, friend, come here. Let me just talk with you for a minute. This is something you need to know. This is something you need to get, you need to understand, and you need to make this a part of your life. Dear friend, and he, he talks to us in this way, it's very important. So a few things that, that we capture from these verses, uh, number one is that obviously love begins with God. If we go looking for it anywhere else in, in the way that we're talking about this morning, we won't find it. It, it always begins with God. And he says love comes from God. And when he writes that, the intention that he has, it's kind of like, um, you know, it, th this is not like a letter that comes from the mailman to your mailbox or a letter that comes from a friend or this is not like the quarterback handing the ball to the, to the running back. You know, this is not where something has been handed off. This is not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is more like this, like heat from fire or the way that light comes from the sun. You see, Heat is part of the nature of fire. Light is a part of the nature of the sun. And in the very same way, God's love that comes to us that we share and have in this life, it comes from his nature. It's not just something that he had and that he chose to give to us in that way. He gave us a part of himself. And so when we understand his love and we accept that love in our life, we're accepting a part of just who he is, a part of his own nature um, into our life. And so love starts with him, and really, you know, if you want to broaden that concept, you could just say, look, everything begins with God. <laughs> On the big stage of life, our life, life in general, the main character, the main actor is God. It all starts with him. And um, I don't know about you, but when I get outside in nature, I get real philosophical about God. Like, um, when I go sit in the deer stand, for example, uh, and really for the last couple of years, I have not been distracted or disturbed by the deer, so I've been able to focus a lot on God, and it's been just great. You know, a lot of peaceful time with nothing coming around to mess me up, and uh, so it's been great. Um, but uh, oftentimes when I'm sitting there, if I sit there long enough, man, I just... I just go to God, you know, I'm just like looking at the trees, and I'm like, God, you, you created the trees, you know, it's like, I look at the big peanut field, God, you did that, you know, and, and I just start thinking about God as creator, God as creator, you know, I didn't make that, you didn't make all that, there is this big God who, in his infinite wisdom, chose to create this, this place that we get to live in, and oftentimes people find God through this creation, it's how he's revealed himself to us. Or if you ever go to the beach and you just sit there long enough to look at the vast ocean and you can just go, wow, 
Look at how big it is. There's a lot of fish in there. I'm getting sunburned. You know what I mean? Whatever you're thinking in that moment. But it's this moment where you just go, man, he's so big to have created all of this. And then sometimes you might even go to the place that I'll go to, which is, I'm so small in light of him. You know, I mean, my little life here that will be so short, and I will have made whatever, you know, impact I will have made here in light of the vastness of God and yet this truth that God pursues me and you. (laughs) We're not too small. God, with ferocity, pursues us and loves us and comes after us. And you know, I think about the words that he gave to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1. He said, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born. I set you apart. That's a, I don't know, that's just a profound thought. When we were just a little twinkle in in the eye of God one day before we ever hit this earth, he already knew us. Before we ever got formed in that womb, he already knew who we were. He knew our name, he knew what we were like, and, and he had a plan for us to come to this earth. And he gifted us and uniquely made us so that we would accomplish his will here. Like, that's the love of the Father. That is the love of creator God for us. And so we remember that all of that begins with him. And then obviously the second point is that we receive that from him. Any love that we share here, this this love that we have already received from him. And just to remind us in verses 9 and 10, you know, John said this, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You know, he, he sent his love to this earth. Think about it that way. So that we might receive that. Now, certainly that is still a choice that we have to receive God's love into our life and to make that real for us. But the love that we have and that we share, we, we receive from him. And, you know, it's so unfortunate. And I, I'm guessing maybe at some level, most or maybe all of us, have sort of looked for love in other places. <laughs> it's like this song, looking for love in all the wrong places. Anyway, I'm not going to sing that one. Cause I but you know, we, we've looked for love or acceptance or value or worth from other people on this earth. You know, it's like, man, I, I want you to love me and I want you to give me worth and I want you to put your stamp of approval on me. And, and you know, there is a certain amount of that that we, we need as humans for sure, but at the end of the day, there's, there's really only one who can value us well, who can give us the worth that we ultimately need, who can love us perfectly. And really what we're looking for is his perfection coming to us in this broken world that we, that we live in. Um, I was thinking about a, a story that I picked up from a blog of a rabbi, uh, and he was writing about uh, this moment that happened at a dinner that he had been at recently uh, at a place up in Brooklyn, New York. It's a school that caters to the learning disabled called uh, Chush. I think that's the name, how you pronounce it anyway. I'm not going to go any further than that. But uh, So this dad gets up at this dinner um, who has a, a disabled son who's a part of this community, and he gets up to speak. And so he's kind of extolling the virtue of the school and how great the staff are and all this kind of stuff. And then he says this. He says, where is the perfection in my son, Sam? Everything God does is done with perfection, but my child cannot understand things as other children do. My child cannot remember facts and figures as other children do. Where is God's perfection? And the audience was kind of shocked by that question. They just didn't see that coming. And, And then he says, I believe that when... God brings a child like this into this world. The perfection that he seeks is in the way that people react to this child. And then he tells a story. And he talks about how he and his son Sam one day were walking through the park. And there was a baseball field. And there were some guys a little older than Sam who were playing baseball. And, and Sam starts tugging at his dad's hand, pulling him over toward the baseball park and saying that he wanted to play baseball. Can I go play baseball? And, you know, his dad was like, ah, oh, you know, and in his mind he's thinking, gosh, we've been through this so many times. And, 
And he's like, are you sure? I, I don't know that you'll be able to or, or they'll you know, let you to and all this kind of stuff. He says, I really want to play. And so his dad you know, goes over and gives it a shot and talks to one of the, the kids there and says, hey, is, is there any chance that, that my son could play baseball with you guys? And the guy was like, I don't know. He looked at his teammates, and they were shrugging their shoulders. And he was like, well, you know, we're losing, and we're getting to the end of the game. Yeah, it's fine. Just bring him out here. We'll, we'll figure out where to put him in. And the dad was shocked. And so little Sam goes out there, and they stick him in the outfield, and nothing really happens, and they just continue to lose. And, and then they come in. Um, they, uh, they're up to bat. They actually get a couple of people on bases, which had not been happening, so they were real excited. And then it's Sam's turn to come up to bat. And so his dad is at the fence, and he's like, oh, my gosh, you know, how is this going to go? And, and uh, so they hand little Sam a bat, and he doesn't know what to do with it. And he walks out to the plate and uh, stands there as he had watched other people do. And then something starts to happen. The pitcher sees what's going on here, and he takes a step up. He takes the baseball, and he just kind of softly tosses it to Sam. Well, Sam, again, he doesn't know what he's doing, and, and he's swinging and chopping at the ball, you know, and everything. And so they pick up the ball, throw it back to the pitcher. One of his teammates comes running out of the dugout comes up behind Sam and reaches around him and grabs the bat with him. And they stand there together at home plate. The pitcher, again, he takes another step forward and he softly tosses the ball up there. And Sam and his buddy hit the ball. It goes dribbling out to the pitcher's mound. Sam is so shocked he doesn't know what to do. He looks up at this guy, you know, and he's like, we should run, we should run. The pitcher, meanwhile, has grabbed the ball with a grin on his face, he takes it and he chunks it out to right field as hard as he could, over the right fielder's head, all the way to the fence. So Sam's buddy's like, run, run. And so Sam runs to the pitcher's mouth. And he's like, no, 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 come back, come back. Run this way, you know. So he takes him, he runs over to first base, and everybody's starting to cheer by now. Run, Sam, run. And so he gets to first base, and he looks at his guy. He's like, well, let's run, keep going. And he's second base, you know. And Sam's like, all right. So Sam's running. Guy out in right field, he gets the ball, he turns around, he's got a big grin on his face, he takes it, he chunks it as hard as he can over the third baseman's head, all the way over to the fence. Sam's still running. He gets to second, looks at the guy, goes, keep going, keep going. He's like, ah, you know, okay, his eyes are big, he doesn't know what he's doing, he's running to third. One of the kids coaching third base is like, come on, keep going, keep going, you know. So he hits third, and he's starting to make home. The guy out in the outfield has grabbed the ball. He's not throwing it. He's running in with the ball. All the outfielders are running in. All the infielders are running towards Sam. All of Sam's teammates have come out of the dugout. Everybody on the field is now running behind Sam as he runs to home plate. He runs, jumps on home plate. Everybody who was anybody near this park was jumping up and down and shouting and, and clapping, and they put Sam on his shoulders, and they're, they're marching him around. And Dad's standing over by the fence with tears in his eyes. And he says at that dinner, that day, those 18 boys reached their level of God's perfection. And it was this beautiful reminder that that's how God love impacts this world. That's how his perfection comes to us. And it's in those moments when we choose to get outside of ourselves and we, we see somebody with value and worth because God has made them. And God loves them. And his love is perfect. And we receive it in that way. And then this last thought that, you know, God's love is so profound, it, it changes us, or at least it should. It is a, a love that, that literally changes us from the inside out and causes us to do things in this life. And if you go down in our verses in 1 John 4 to 19 to 21, it says, We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. And so God's love causes us to change how we look at people. Maybe it causes us to, to get rid of our prejudices. It causes us to, to, to look at people through God's lens, right? And in there he says, we ought 
to love each other. It's this really great word. It, it kind of is like the way fish ought to swim, the way birds ought to fly, you know, the way humans ought to breathe, the way peaches ought to be sweet, and lemons ought to be tart, the way born-again believers ought to love one another. And um, it changes us, and it changes people around us. I picked up uh, a story out of uh, San Francisco, <laughs> interesting story about this lady who's a bus driver out there, and she has, like, created this buzz, um, and uh, she's kind of gotten to be a little celebrity out there, and it's all because of the way that she treats people when they get on her bus, and the way that she cares for them and reaches out to them in ways that she doesn't have to, it's not required of her job or anything, and um, it, it's so profound that people have started choosing her bus, and it's actually causing a problem <laughs> because everybody wants to get on her bus so they create these big long lines and it's hard for people to get around it and other buses aren't stopping and all this kind of stuff so um, but just a couple of examples um, she uh, her name is Linda Wilson and uh, one day this lady named Miss Ivy was trying to get on the bus and she had two um, grocery bags full of groceries and and uh, she was really having a hard time getting up the stairs and so Miss Linda saw what was happening she sort of stopped everything stopped people from trying to get on and and she got down and she helped grab the few things that had already fallen out, put them back in the bags and took her and, and, and helped her find her seat and made sure that she was situated and, and uh, just cared for her in that moment. Um, another time she was at the bus terminal and there was a, a, a lady that was sitting on a bench by herself and, and she just, out of who Linda is, went over there and began to talk with her and discovered that she was in town, she was alone. Uh, Thanksgiving was in just two days away. And so Linda says, you know what? why don't you just come to my house for Thanksgiving? You know, I know, I know you're going to be here over the weekend, and I don't want you to be alone. Why don't you just come with us? The lady comes over, hangs out with Linda and her family for Thanksgiving. They've now become best friends. Those are just two stories of, of a lot of stories of what she has done. So here's what's happened. Over time, people have started now bringing Linda stuff. If they have extra vegetables, they just bring them with her and give them to Linda. They found out that she loves scarves. She wears the same uniform every day when she rides the bus, and so scarves kind of help liven things up. So they bring her scarves. So she has this whole, like, thing of scars and they've come to love her because of the way that she has loved them and in this article it says that her mood is set at 2 30 a.m. when she gets down on her knees to pray for 30 minutes <laughs> her day begins right there and she says you know what there's a lot to talk about with the Lord there's a lot to talk about and when she gets to the end of her line the bus line and she's done for the day she has this sort of phrase that she says. She says, that's all. I love you. Take care. Every time she comes in, that's all. I love you. Take care. How many bus drivers tell you they love you? <laughs> I mean, imagine the crazy day a bus driver has and all that they have to put up with and deal with. But you know what? She just, she just turns that around and focuses it and says, you know what? I love you. You're on my bus for a reason, so I want to reach out to you in any way that I can. And you might ask, well, where's the kingdom of God in this world? I bet it's on bus number 45 out in San Francisco. Where's the church? I bet it's Miss Linda doing what she's doing in bus 45 out in San Francisco. It's that beautiful picture of, of the way that we reach out and that we care for people. And, and I will say that in this day and age and in our society and in, in this world that we live in, it's very challenging, isn't it? And we will be challenged as followers of Christ to love people well. And it's going to get more challenging as we go down this road. And, um, you know, I think about what just happened this past week with the Supreme Court ruling. Uh, that they uh, legalized gay marriage. And um, I had a few people at the end of this week text me or ask me about that. In other words, does this affect the church or how will this affect the church or how will this affect the our church uh, specifically and and um, so I wanted to address that and I want to do that as sensitively as I can um, this morning uh, first of all just a very practical matter related to this that the federal government uh, can't tell the church what to do or how to minister or, or how to function that's protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution but um, in the United Methodist Book of Discipline we're United Methodist and so every United Methodist Church has a discipline that we go by um, and in there, it has uh, statements about lots of different things, but I wanted to read a couple to you this morning. One is about marriage. We affirm the sanctity of the marriage covenant that is expressed in love, mutual support, personal commitment, and shared fidelity between a man and a woman. 
We believe that God's blessing rests upon such marriage, whether or not there are children of the union. We support laws in civil society that define marriage as the union of one man and one woman. And then the next section is a statement on human sexuality, and it says this. We affirm that all persons are individuals of sacred worth created in the image of God. All persons need the ministry of the church in their struggles for human fulfillment, as well as the spiritual and emotional care of a fellowship that enables reconciling relationships with God, with others, and with self. United Methodist Church does not condone the practice of homosexuality and consider this practice incompatible with Christian teaching. We affirm that God's grace is available to all. We will seek to live together in Christian community, welcoming, forgiving, and loving one another as Christ has loved and accepted us. We implore families and churches not to reject or condemn lesbian and gay members and friends. We commit ourselves to be in ministry for and with all persons. And, you know, we very much here in this church align with that statement right there. And, you know, we believe that uh, marriage has already been defined scripturally as one man and one woman together in a covenant made before God. Uh, that will never change, certainly here at this church. And um, we believe that falls in line with thousands of years of Orthodox Christianity, of mainline denominations, of, you know, all of that. But we will be in ministry to all persons. We will be in ministry to all persons. As much as we absolutely possibly can, we will. I want to read another statement to you. It's uh, from a magazine that I used to work for called Good News, and this is just an excerpt from an article that they wrote. Christians have always been called to be countercultural to the world's values and actions. As Wesleyans, which we are as United Methodist, we take that charge seriously. We are to be people who love the broken and the mistreated and at the same time promote scriptural holiness, knowing that the ways of God, though at times difficult to follow, always bring freedom, healing, and life. We are in the world, but not of the world, and we will not let the world determine what we believe or how we minister to persons who are hurting and who are lost. And so essentially, we will stand on the truth of God's word with great passion, and we will seek to love all people and introduce them to the life-giving grace of Jesus Christ with just as much passion. And you know, this, this is exactly what we've been talking about. Love God all that he is all that he has revealed to us all that he has said to us all that he has done for us love God and then love people love them because God created them not because of what they do or how they act or any of these kinds of things we love because God first loved us and God reached out to us before we ever knew him Are you with me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your truth revealed in Scripture to us. A truth that is um, comes straight from your heart. We believe that we find real life when we adhere to your word and when we remain committed to your path. And we know that a part of that revealed truth is that you have loved us in ways that we can't even possibly imagine. That you have looked down on little us in our lives and, and you have pursued us that you formed us before we ever got here you knew us and what the our purpose would be in life and so God we thank you for that we are humbled in light of that truth we are amazed at your grace and Lord we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ to prove that love for us And so, God, the challenge is for us to live that way in this life, for your love to be revealed in a world that is struggling in brokenness in darkness and pain. And more darkness will not help. And so, God, I just pray that all of us would 
would not just know the challenge, but would take up the challenge to be a light in the darkness, to be people who are ambassadors of the love of Jesus Christ in this world. And God, we need your strength and we need your courage to do that. And we need your help. Because at the end of the day, we just want to see your kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, come to earth. The kingdom of perfection. So God, give us grace. Give us all that we need to be your follower in this world today. So once again, we bow the knee to you. And we lay down our life. We say thank you. In Jesus' name.